challenges modern Christianity. And at first we might think that this is a rather challenging title because wouldn't we expect that modern Christianity and the Bible would actually be totally at one with each other? And certainly, if modern Christianity, as the custodian of the Word of God, which they would claim to be, if they were upholding that responsibility, then surely that would be the case. But, if we were to ask a theologian what the situation was, isn't this what he would say? Wouldn't we find that he places greater importance on humanism and human philosophy than on the teaching of the Bible? Because they have long ago usurped the authority of the Bible to themselves and have placed greater emphasis on human thinking than on what the Bible says with which they, to a large extent, don't agree. But if we were asked to ask exactly the same thing of a clean Bible student, somebody that constantly in his life was reading and studying the Word of God, what would he say? To him it wouldn't be a surprise either because he would say that he was very conversant with the divergence of modern Christianity from Bible teaching. And so we can almost say, well, what are we really here to discuss? Well, there is a responsibility. And if we go back somewhat into the Old Testament, to the end of the Old Testament, actually, into the book of Malachi, what we'll find there is Almighty God, through the prophet Malachi, speaking about the responsibility that the priests had in Israel. Now, they were the theologians of the day, weren't they? And he said to them, for the priests' lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law. At his mouth, who's that? The people should seek the law of God at the mouth of the priest. It was the priest's responsibility to understand the law of Almighty God. That's this book. That's the Bible, the Old Testament, which they had in their possession. For he, that is the priest, is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And that's incidentally the militant of Almighty God. So we're not actually dealing with things here that are without a sense of judgment impending upon them. Now the next verse in Malachi, we find that the Jews were condemned for failing in this issue. And Malachi said to them, Ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law, and ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, they had fallen down on their responsibility to understand the word of God and to teach it to the people. That's the simplicity of it. And where have they fallen down? They philosophized upon it. And they turned it into an art form that had very little to do with the things of Almighty God. It was their own humanistic thinking. Now we might think, well, okay, that's the Old Testament, but what about the New Testament? We're people of the New Testament, aren't we? Well, that's to some extent, but of course the New Testament wholly based on the Old Testament anyway. Well, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking really to the same people. 
When he condemned the scribes and the Pharisees, and if you go to Matthew chapter 23, you'll find that the chapter is largely full of that. And in this chapter, he really addresses the scribes and Pharisees, but elsewhere in the New Testament, you'll find that he addressed similar comments to the Sadducees also. In other words, all the leaders of the Jews in Jerusalem, in Judea at that time, he said unto them, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven, that's the kingdom of Almighty God, against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Now what does that really mean? What it's telling us is that the scribes and the Pharisees were so hypocritical in what they were teaching the people that they were not going to go into the kingdom of God. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who was speaking to them. Surely they should have listened to his words. But not only that, they weren't only misguiding themselves, but they were also misguiding the people. And this is a serious responsibility. This is the start of Christianity, if you like. Uh, but we must ask the question to ourselves. Is the modern church, is modern Christianity any better than this? Now there is a difference between the Wisdom of men and the wisdom of, all, of Almighty God. Now, at first you might think, well, okay, is there? Well, why is there? Well, there is because Almighty God said it there. He said his wisdom above ours and above that which we can attain to. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 very amply describes that situation to us. Now you might think, who was the Apostle Paul? Well, the Apostle Paul was a Jew, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Now if you want a theologian that was probably the theologian to put at the top of the list, even down to this day, that was probably him. He was steeped in the Old Testament, of course, because the New Testament didn't then exist. But he was also absolutely steeped in how to philosophise upon those things until they became of none effect. Now the Apostle Paul grew up and was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the best teacher that there was. And this is what he said concerning that wisdom that he was brought up with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that we have just read, in verse 1, the Apostle says, I came to you not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now the wisdom he's talking about is the wisdom of men, not the wisdom of God. The reading of these two chapters makes that very obvious. In verse, I'm declaring unto you the testimony of God. So he makes a difference between his poor speech, which the people had to put up with, the wisdom that he had been trained in, which he could see the problem with, and the testimony of God, which he is elevating, as being the worthwhile thing to take hold of. In verse 4 we read that he came to them not with the enticing words of man's wisdom. So again we can see that those things that he'd been taught in those schools of the Pharisees, because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he was at the top of the list. 
He didn't want to use those enticing words of man's wisdom because that is how he saw them in the light of the things of Almighty God. He had now understood. In verse 5, that your faith, and that's our faith also, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he didn't want the people to be taught the things that came out of the schools of the Pharisees, the theologians of the day, the theological philosophers of the day. He wanted the people to understand the things of Almighty God, that they might take hold of the wisdom of Almighty God. Now this is a challenge to each and every one of us. But the Apostle Paul, in chapter 2 and verse 15 of 1 Corinthians, said, gave us the reason why. He said that because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, if we want to take a humanistic approach to the things of Almighty God, which I believe is exactly what the churches do, what the theologians do, they'll study Homer before they'll study the Bible, then they need to understand this principle. That if they really want to understand the things of Almighty God, then they need to take those human philosophies and simply drop them in the bin and get on with trying to understand what Almighty God has put in the Bible for us to understand. Now when we go back to the previous chapter, the chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, and if you were to read from verse 17 through to verse, in fact right from verse 17 to the end of that chapter, you, you'll be able to understand the attitude that the Apostle Paul was presenting to them. But in verse 25 he said, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now it's like he's setting up a little graph, isn't it? And he's saying, okay, where's the foolishness of man? It's right down there in the graph. And the foolish, the, the wisdom of man comes up so that he well, he says, look above that. Somewhere up above that is where the foolishness of God starts. And the wisdom of God is right up there. And what he's saying to us is we can actually take hold of some of that wisdom of God by understanding that the wisdom of man is down there and the wisdom of God is there and we need to take hold of it by reading and understand the Bible. Because he said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But God hath chosen, and note this, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, back there in, in, uh, in, uh, in verse 23, the apostle said, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. You see, the Jews, to them it was a stumbling block that Christ had been crucified. They thought he was an imposter. They are yet to realise he is their Messiah and King. But to the Greeks, the Greeks were the great philosophers. They were the ones that had philosophized upon everything. And they were the ones that were the fountain of human philosophy even down to this day and age. They are the humanists. And he said, present these things to them. Present the teaching of the resurrection, for instance, to them, and they say it's foolishness. You're kidding yourself. And if we were to present these things to a humanist, 
What would be his reaction? Exactly the same thing. And so God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now man in his wisdom wants to elevate himself above Almighty God. Try to get a humanist to understand that Almighty God is greater than man. And men who seek to understand the wisdom of God, they look upon as weak and requiring a prop. We need something to lean on, that's what they say. But in reality, the attitude of the humanist, including the humanistic theologian, actually restricts the understanding that we will have to that of man down here and excludes us from the wisdom of Almighty God. That's Paul's argument. Clearly, to understand the wisdom of Almighty God, we must refer ourselves to his wisdom. We cannot philosophise on what it might be. We need to read it and to understand it. And we will not find the wisdom of Almighty God in philosophy or in humanism. So, but there's one thing we do need. The humanist will say we are weak and we need the prop. He's wrong, natural fact. Because the person that seeks to understand the things of Almighty God, he won't be weak if he does it correctly. He will be meek, which is a very different thing. And the idea of meekness is that there is an attitude of teachableness that we might learn the things of Almighty God. Now in considering the subject before us this evening, the Bible challenges modern Christianity, I'm simply going to take one issue. Time constraints have really made me do it this way. And that one issue is the teaching of the Bible contrasted with the theory of the immortal soul. Now firstly, let us look at the at church teaching concerning the immortal soul. And I've taken this off the internet, and if you go on there and type in the immortal soul, you'll get an abundance of these definitions of the immortal soul, so, and they're all very similar. But this is just one that I took. That the soul of man is something in the human body capable of living out of the body. And notice these things of eating, drinking, feeling, tasting, smelling, thinking, singing, and of the same essence as God himself. So it's part of the essence of God. And then at death, that soul wafts to heavenly bliss, or if evil, to the fiery torments of hell. And that's pretty much what I was taught as a churchgoer, somewhat in inverted commas, as a child. If I had been asked to write a definition of it, you probably would have got something fairly similar to that. Incidentally, I was also told you could fit a million immortal souls on the head of a pig. They wouldn't eat much, would they? They wouldn't drink much. And yet they eat and they drink. And so even with these simple things, we start to see the flaws in this philosophy. The evangelist Billy Graham, when I, poked, when I typed in the immortal soul on the internet, his name came up very quickly. And why not? He's preached, they say, to several billion people. He's now 95, I think he's still alive. 
He would now be 95 or 95 this year, I think. And really, he is a spiritual father to millions of modern Christians. And I think that's a pretty fair definition of that man's situation. He's also, and this is interesting, been a spiritual advisor to all the US presidents since Dwight Eisenhower, and to the best of my knowledge, including Barack Obama, who's now the president. So he's a man of substantial standing in the Christian community, and I'm sure that we've all heard of him. And this is what he defined, or this is one of the definitions that he has of the soul. He says, you have a soul, and it will go to heaven or hell when you die. The soul is a mysterious, spiritual, an immortal part of the human being that leaves the cold, dead body at death. So when your body's dead, when the breath's gone out of it, the last breath, and you've gone cold, the mortal soul's gone off to heaven or to hell if you haven't been very nice. Now, we want to go back again in history. Because the theory of the immortal soul is actually not new. It became an article of the Christian faith in about 1500. But back in 429 to 327 BC, now if that's Plato's life, he lived fairly off. There was a Greek philosopher, a great Greek philosopher by the name of Plato. And this theory of the immortal soul, we find, was very popular amongst ancient pagans. You find it in the Babylonian beliefs, in the Egyptian beliefs, in the Greek beliefs, in the Roman beliefs, and pretty much you go to any pagan religion today and the belief will have in it some, some version of the theory of the immortal soul. And as we know, most Christians believe in the immortality of the soul, not all. And what this, uh, this great Greek philosopher Plato, he popularised the ancient theory of an immortal soul. He really brought it into science, because he brought it into philosophy. And in his teaching he said that the immortal soul embraced the concept of reincarnation. In other words, it's a there's a store of souls somewhere and they go from one thing to another. And he said how that happened. The soul left the body at death, migrated to the realm of the pure forms. That's where they sort of take their resting place. That's their resting place. That's their resort. And then could return to the earth in another form. Now Plato was one of the great fathers of philosophy and humanism. He was the great student of Socrates. And he helped to lay the foundations of Western philosophy and science. And this, of course, predates Christ and the apostles. But Christian belief in the immortal soul dates after 150 AD. Now that's interesting. I want to just hold on to it. And so the modern teaching that the soul is immortal is in fact not biblical, but borrowed from the pagans of antiquity, long after the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as early as AD 150, Justin Martyr wrote of those who he said, there is no resurrection of the dead and that their souls when they die are taken to heaven. Now in actual fact I think they were condemned by him at that point. I'm not totally sure and there's a little doubt on my mind whether he was agreeing with them or disagreeing with them. But as early as AD 150 we can say that some Christians whether it was Justin Martyr, Martyr amongst them or not I'm not sure that said there is no resurrection of the dead and that their souls when they die are taken to heaven. Now that's 
the earliest recording, evidently, this is written by a theologian, not by me. This is the earliest recording, therefore, of Christians believing in the immortal soul. And yet this theory had been around since 400 BC. The second point we have here is that by the beginning of the 3rd century, Tertullian had declared the immortality of the soul to be a Christian doctrine. So now it's become a Christian doctrine, 200 years after Christ. And he wrote, the soul then we divine to be sprung from the breath of God, immortal, possessing body, having form, simple in its substance, intelligent in its own nature. And that's in a treatise on the soul. But the third point we have here is that after being advocated for centuries by men such as Oregon, Ambrose and Augustine, it wasn't until 1513 that the Roman Catholic Church under Pope Leo X officially accepted what nearly everyone had already come to believe. And at the Fifth Lateran Council, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul was finally adopted as an article of the Christian faith. So it's almost 2,000 years after. And yet the New Testament was completed before 150. Long before. But today, the immortality of the soul is taken for granted by most Catholics and most Protestants. It's almost universal. But what, we, what do we find when we come to the Bible? The first thing that we will come to realise when we exercise ourselves in understanding what the Bible teaches concerning the soul is that never do we read the words immortal and soul written as immortal soul or connected in that context. It just simply doesn't exist. Get out of concordance and look for those two words together. You won't find them. So we have to go back if we want to understand what the word soul really means. You see, in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostles, they didn't have the Bible as we have it today because they were still in the process of writing the New Testament. What they used as the scriptures was what was in the synagogues or in the temple in Jerusalem. And that was the Old Testament. And so had you come to one of the apostles and said, what does the word soul mean? Or nephesh, as it was in the Hebrew, they would have taken you back into the Old Testament to understand it. Now, the rule you always use in trying to understand something like that is you go back to the beginning of it. You go back to the first use of it. And that's what we want to do now. We want to go back to the book of Genesis. So Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And we're actually going to start in chapter 2 because that's where it first refers to man. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we read this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And that word soul there is the Hebrew word nephesh. And generally you find that soul is trans translated from the Hebrew nephesh several hundred times. <coughs> If we add some Hebrew words into it that some people might find helpful, we can expand that understanding a little bit because the Lord God formed, and the word there is yatsar in the Hebrew, which means to mould like a potter moulding clay. 
It formed the man Adam, or man, which is the Hebrew word Adam, of the dust, the aphar, of the ground, the adama, and breathed, napak, into his nostrils the breath, neshama, of life, kai, and man, again the word Adam, became a living, the word, the Hebrew word kai, soul, the Hebrew word nefesh. We want to look at this a little more closely. The first thing we want to note is that in fact man was not formed from a spiritual substance. Man was formed from the dust. That's the first thing we read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust, the aphar of the ground, the, the, the adama. And only when God himself breathed into the man did he become a living being, see? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, breathe is the Hebrew napak, and it's the verb form of nefesh. And you can see it here in the in the red writing on the screen. That the, uh, Almighty God breathed napak into his nostrils the breath of the breath, the sharma of life, and man became a living soul, a, 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 ne, a living nefesh. And you can see the similarity between napak and nefesh. And so when God breathed into the man that he had formed of the clay, he became alive as a breathing creature. And so that's what we have there. This living creature is a breathing creature. Almighty God had breathed into him the breath of life to give him that life, to make him that living creature. So what we can understand from that is that when Adam, the man, or any other creature, if it comes to that, stops breathing, he's no longer going to be alive. Now, I've got granddaughters that like to ride on my back in the swimming pool and get me on the bottom. And I know that you can get about three minutes down there, and they try to extend that, I think. But what I know is that when you start to get under, when you've been under the water for a couple of minutes, you are really starting to run out of it breath and you you stop there you're going to drown and your life is going to be taken away because that breath is gone so we know don't we that we are absolutely dependent upon that breath for life take away that breath we're dead and nefesh therefore this living soul is therefore the result of breathing Now let's just have a look at the, some of the other uses of that Hebrew word that is translated soul. That's the Hebrew word nephesh. The first thing is that we will not find it referring to an immortal soul. Never is it translated immortal soul. That's what we've said before. But the first thing we want to look at is in reference to man. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 that we've just been reading, we saw that Man became a living soul, a kinefish. That's in Hebrew, essentially, not quite exactly like that in the Hebrew Bible. But that's the effect. But it's also used, if we go back a chapter into Genesis chapter 1 and verse 24, it's used of beasts. It's used of animals. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living, the kai, Creature, nephesh, so it's living creature, it's kai nephesh, exactly the same words are used in Genesis chapter 1 verse 24 to refer to animals as is used in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 to refer to men. Okay, let us move on. So the soul can and does die. And we read of this in Leviticus chapter 21 
at verse 11, where nephesh is translated body. But in this case, the body is dead. It's a muth nephesh. It's a dead body. Neither shall you go into any dead body. And so again, there you have the word nephesh, now dead. In other words, the breath's gone out. It's died. And souls can die in Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. All souls, nephesh, are mine, says Almighty God. As the soul, nephesh, of the Father, so the soul, nephesh, of the Son is mine. The soul, nephesh, that sinneth, it shall die. So they can die and they can sin. Now, will an immortal spark from Almighty God sin? I don't think that's allowable under the understanding we have of the things of Almighty God. And so in accord with Strong's first definition for Nephesh, it simply means a breathing creature. And if it stops breathing, it dies. Now in the New Testament, the most common word used is sukkah. Translated again, soul. And W.E. Vine, in his expository dictionary of Greek words, and in my copy it's in, on page 1077, uh, in another copy evidently it's on page 1067, if you look under soul you're going to find it, he says this, now it's my understanding that W.E. Vine believed in the immortality of the soul. So you can expect that he is going to try to uh, elevate that belief in his writing. We would expect to see that. But he says that soul, when it's translated from suke, denotes the breath, the breath of life, then the soul in all its various meaning. In other words, it's similar to Nephesh in the Old Testament. But he also lists a number of other meanings, and I've listed some of them here. The natural life of the body, that's what we've seen in regard to Nephesh, isn't it? The immaterial, invisible part of man. Now he'd probably say that's the immortal soul. But the breath is also invisible. You can't see it. You can't see us breathing in the air. If it's a, if it's a cold day, you might see the, the water vapour in the air, but you don't actually see the air. The disembodied, now I'm not sure what he means by that. The seat of the sentient element. Well, isn't the body exactly that? The seat of appetite. Well, when I get hungry, I know, I know what's hungry. It's my body that's looking for food. Persons and individuals. It's exactly what we've been looking at. An animate creature. Exactly what we saw in Genesis 1 verse 24. Human or other, Genesis 2 verse 7. So really... The weight of evidence here, in the New Testament also, is to define the body, not an immortal component of a human being. And so logically, since Nephesh and Sukkot both contain the idea of breathing, we must conclude that the soul is not immortal, but very much a dying thing, very much mortal. And so in, life, in the Bible, life is associated with breathing, not with an immortal soul, and death is identified with the cessation of breathing and life, not an immortal soul floating on back to Almighty God in heaven. Now there's another fact that we can add into this argument here, and that is the fact that Almighty God only possesses immortality. He only is immortal and incorruptible. And we can read of that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, and Romans 1, verse 23, which I haven't put up. But in Timothy we read, who only hath immortality. Almighty God is the only one who hath immortality. You can't get it much plainer than that. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, and so forth. And yet by nature, man is both mortal and corruptible. And so incorruption and immortality are things we must put on. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 53 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
and this mortal must put on immortality. If we already possessed incorruption and immortality, there would be no reason to put them on. In 1959, an evangelist visited this city here. He visited all the cities in Australia, all the major cities. I was a young man at the time and I saw the huge effect that he had upon people. My best friend at school was converted over a weekend. I couldn't believe it. And this is what he said at the time. Now, I actually cut this out of the paper. And I wrote it into my Bible uh, that was actually given to me for my birthday the next year, in 1960. And this is what it says. The soul of man is immortal. It will never die. It is the part of man that thinks, feels, dreams, aspires, the ego and the personality that will continue to have conscious existence in death. Now... We can examine that in the light of Bible knowledge, which is what I did back then. I cut that out of the paper and kept it and wrote it into my Bible. It's in my Bible, it's still at home. Now that evangelist said these things, and we want to take it one part of the time. The soul of man is immortal, he says, it will never die. It is a part of man that thinks. Yet Psalm 146 says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth. He's going to die. He returneth to his earth, like Adam came from the earth. He's going to go back to it. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Can his soul think? No, his thoughts have perished. We take the next part, that it feels. For the living know they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. Can you feel if you don't know anything? Psalm 6 and verse 5, concerning dreams. In death there is no remembrance of me. In the grave, who can give thee thanks? You can't even praise God in the grave, let alone dream dreams. It is a part of man that aspires. Well, Isaiah 38 and verse 18 says, For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. So where are your aspirations if you cannot do those things? Isn't an immortal soul going to want to praise Almighty God? Those that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And that's where your body is. That's where your soul is when you die. It's in the grave. That's where we put the bodies. The ego and the personality. Well, look at Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth peace. Where's your ego? When you die, you're simply as the beasts of the earth that are going to corrupt back into the dust of the earth unless you have a hope that will take you out of it. Man hath no preeminence above the beast. All is vanity. Pretty straight language. And this will continue to have conscious conscious existence in death. So the soul is going to continue to have conscious existence in death. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 6 says, Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Aren't these the very things that we are told the immortal soul hangs on to? There is no, they have, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now what about all these things that they have said an immortal soul does? Let us just be reasonable about science. Aren't they functions of the nervous system that have a much more substantial existence than that supposed by immortal souls? Don't they require a brain and interconnecting nervous fibres and sensors to work? We've got sensors in our fingers, our tongues, all over our body that all go back to the spinal cord or to the brain that we might feel and be able to do various things. It's a function of inherited characteristics. We inherit them from our parents as they have been affected by the environment in which they exist. 
educating now it's the environment that as we grow the things that happen around us that as we grow educate that nervous tissue and activate it through the interaction of electrochemical reactions within the amino acids and so forth and enzymes and so forth that make up our cells. Now isn't that roughly from my memory of vet science 50 years ago memory is stored in the brain, isn't it? Is it just stored in this microscopic thing? Remove part of the brain or damage the nervous system and see what happens. We all know. So what are the soul in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible do we read the phrase, the phrase immortal soul. Never does the Bible indicate that a person continues to live after the death of the body. There is no immortal essence existent within us. It's simply not a proposition of the Bible. But the Bible teaches clearly that hope is in the resurrection of the body to eternal life. Almighty God does not leave us without hope. The Bible teaches clearly that hope is in the resurrection of the body. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a beautiful chapter that, uh, where Paul expounds upon the virtues of the resurrection of the dead and the fact that without it we don't have it. And we're actually wasting our time. He says, if there be no resurrection, in verse 13 and 14, he says, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. Now, our hope is in the resurrection of Christ, isn't it? Without the resurrection of Christ, we're of all people... Most woeful. We haven't got a hope. We, we just we should be out playing football and cricket or something instead of talking about the things of Almighty God. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So everything we have done here tonight is total vanity if there is no resurrection of the dead. You know, I've heard theologians, very significant ones, of high profile, actually live just down the road here, who said that they doubted that there was such a thing as the, uh, as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Where would we stand with people like that leading us? Let us let wisdom have its course. In the Old Testament we read, to the law and to the testimony. This is Isaiah 8 and verse 20. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Thank you.